Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. I'm Adam Cronin. And today we're discussing the future of carbon capture. So we'll go over a few things. Why carbon capture is necessary, how carbon capture occurs, and whether or not this technology will be able to curb carbon emissions enough so that the human race can avoid the worst impacts of uh, climate change. So maybe, Madam Moore, let's let's start with the why. Like, how, why yeah. why are we going to talk about this today? Yeah. So I find it really useful to take a step back and sort of look at the high level million year geological time scales. And when you do that, you know, scientists drill into the ice and they can find these air bubbles so they can tell exactly what the atmospheric composition was at different times in the past. And what they've found is that we now have more carbon in the atmosphere than there ever has been since the time of the dinosaurs. So it's, it's yeah. pretty remarkable how much carbon we've put into the atmosphere. And we can map it out from before humans were around until when humans were around but weren't emitting fossil fuels to now what it is today. So it might be helpful to put some numbers to it. So during the last ice age, there were 180 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere. That means if there's a million uh, molecules, 180 of them are carbon, which is still, you know, it's not like that much. Yeah. Um, when humans were around and thriving, but not yet emitting uh, fossil fuels, the parts per million was 280. And most recently, we are now at 410 parts per million. So yeah, this is yeah, a... Yeah, that 400 mark was a, a really pivotal moment. Yeah. And, and just to get a sense for what the impact, like what it actually means. So from the time of, you know, when it was at the ice age of 180 to the time when, you know, agricultural revolution, but before humans were emitting carbon, that difference is the difference in there being thick ice sheets covering all of New York, Chicago, Seattle. That's yep. a major difference in the composition of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really astounding. And one thing that's, that is astounding to me in particular is that right now we should be moving towards the next ice age. Because if you look at the geological record, basically, depending on how the Earth is tilted towards the sun and how close it is to the sun, it goes through these periods of warmer periods and colder periods. So based on that, we should be heading towards the next ice age. It should be getting colder and colder every year. And yet the opposite is happening. It's getting warmer yeah. and warmer every year. And it's so, to such a degree that many scientists believe that human beings wouldn't have even evolved in the first place if the atmosphere conditions were the same that they are today, back then when we were evolving. So it's definitely not the ideal conditions for life. And as we look towards, you know, why do we need carbon capture in particular? There is so much carbon already in the atmosphere from the time the Industrial Revolution began, but we're pumping more every single year. So you have the cumulative carbon, and then you have the new carbon that's added every year. And there's yep. 40 billion tons of additional carbon every year. And in order to avoid the worst effects of global warming, based on the IPCC and the Paris Climate Accords, if we want to stay within the threshold where it doesn't get you know, horribly bad, we would mm -hmm. need to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. Yeah. So that means that not only do we have to... like. I mean, it's pretty unrealistic to think that we'll just stop emitting carbon at all in 30 years. Right. So yeah. the only plausible solution is let's suck carbon directly out of the atmosphere. And that's why this is such a big topic. And that's why we're discussing it today, because every day that goes by, we are more and more dependent on carbon capture because carbon mm -hmm. mitigation is just not going to do the job enough on its right. own. I would say it's worth mentioning that this is like this is one tool in the toolbox. Like we can't rely on carbon capture completely. Right. We still need to focus on clean energy like solar, like nuclear. We've mm -hmm. and we've talked about these things before. But like you said, we keep emitting uh, carbon. We 
have a lot of carbon already there. Like that's the big thing. We can we can reduce our emissions to nothing, and we will still have too much carbon in the air. Right. We need to right. take it out. So, anyways, yeah, the, it's really interesting. Maybe yeah. maybe we talk a little bit about how like how do we even do that in the first place? Though. Right. So the difficult part about carbon capture is that you know, like we said, even 480 parts per million, that's a pretty low um, amount. You know, if you add 480, it's like a needle in a haystack, essentially. So the way that it actually works with the current technology is you have these massive fans that are trying to get enough air through the system because you need to have a wide surface area so you can filter in enough carbon. And then as the air gets filtered through these honeycomb filters, this chemical basically rains down on top of it and latches onto it or like soaks into it like a sponge almost. Mm -hmm. And then that creates calcium carbonate, which is essentially the same sort of material as we find with seashells, which is Mm -hmm. the name, which is why Shell Oil Company is called Shell Oil Company, because that's the material. Mm -hmm. And then that calcium carbonate can be used in one of three ways. So one is the best way for the environment would be you just put it way down deep into the earth and it's totally stored. Another option is you use it to extract more fuel from the ground. And then the third option is you actually create synthetic fuel with that calcium carbonate. Hmm. So with the the storage, one of the things that I, I saw is we we don't know for sure if it's the safest option to store the carbon in the earth. I mean, the the same sort of thing that we talked about with the nuclear energy. Mm-hmm. Um, if there is somehow a leak, it seems that there is evidence that it's definitely not good for the surrounding wildlife, particularly the plants. Right. They they can die off, and or if they don't die, then they're just grow slower. And it's still a negative impact. So we need to find places very deep down and in places that will, you know, they won't be subject to these seismic movements. Another, you know, the same reason why nuclear and nuclear waste is being stored in some places in Finland. You know, we need we need to make sure that the ground is safe that we're putting it in and it's not going to be re-released. did it? Did you look at all, or did you see anything about um, research into putting this carbon at the bottom of the ocean? Because one of the hmm. interesting things I saw was, um, and there's no research. Like this is a very tentative idea, and I don't think it's being used um, because there's no evidence on whether it's good or bad or what it would do um, to the environment. Um, but with such high pressures in the very depths of the ocean, we might just be able to keep the carbon in a relatively safe form down at the very bottom, like 3,000 meters down, which is a totally crazy amount of pressure right. um, that can just keep it. It might even be able to be stored in, in a liquid form down there. Um, but anyways, that, that yeah. was another one that I saw that was interesting. Right. Well, too. I do know that calcium carbonate is highly soluble so if it Mm -hmm. did if water did seep into it whether it's groundwater or ocean water it would pretty Mm -hmm. instantly just mix into that ecosystem so i think it would have to be like you know in the bedrock below the ocean for for that to work in the long run Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean it's a really difficult problem and when you look at it's like anything related to carbon capture is essentially better than what the status quo is right now. Um, you know, one of the major right. companies is the one backed by Bill Gates called Carbon Engineering. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this company um, has gotten a lot of criticism because they partner with oil companies like, uh, you know, like Shell and like uh, Occidental and these other mm-hmm. companies. And, you know, people say, hey, if you're for the renewable green energy movement, why are you partnering with these oil companies? You're just you're using the carbon you capture to extract more oil to burn more carbon. Like, how does that make any sense? But Mm -hmm. I have to say that 
at least it's a step in the right direction because it's better than just extracting oil without sequestering any carbon. And it's a really difficult place right now from a business perspective because mm -hmm. there's not much government support for this. There's yeah. not a widespread carbon tax that would be make it financially feasible to actually extract carbon as a company and make that a profitable company. So right. Bill Gates has to do what is economically viable right now, which is partnering yeah. with companies, oil companies that want to meet the demands of California, which has mandated that by the year 2030, all fuel must be 20% more efficient as far as the carbon mm -hmm. it emits than currently. So the whole US is sort of rallying around this one goal yeah. that California put in place because California is you know, a big enough economy <laughs> that no, you know, Fortune 500 company is going to survive if they can't market yeah, California yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a step in the right direction, but it's just, it's not necessarily the ideal solution. Right. Yeah. And, and the other thing that um, I, I saw a couple of TED talks and these these farms, people are calling them artificial forests, essentially. You know, mm -hmm. we talked in the um, fires episode, we talked about how the Amazon was a carbon sink. You know, there, it's it's storing a lot of carbon. The the surface area or the land area required to filter carbon this at the same rate as the Amazon is a small fraction of the actual Amazon. And you can put these these facilities in like desert arid environments that aren't developed. Like you don't need right. to tear down more trees to put these up, which I think is a really cool thing. I don't know what your thoughts are on the aesthetics of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're I, I mean, I don't if know how matters, much worse they are matter. than wind farms, but yeah. um, I was astounded by how powerful these things are. So one of these carbon engineering plants has the same capability of, of sequestering carbon as 40 million trees. So yeah. yeah, you could plant a lot of trees, but to get the same sort of power of sequestering carbon would take a lot of time. It would take a lot of land area yeah. and you know, it, it just wouldn't solve the problem on the timescales that are necessary for us to avoid the worst effects of climate change. So again, it's not an either or. We should be planting more trees, protecting our forests, uh, you know, changing to more renewable energies, especially nuclear. We should probably talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition, we need to you know, build as many of these plants as possible. I saw numbers that said that if we build 40,000 of these carbon engineering plants, and put them around the world, each plant would suck up one megaton of carbon per year. That would be enough to be carbon neutral for that year. Now, we wouldn't be getting any carbon that was accumulated in previous years. That would take right. a lot more plants, but at yeah. least we could stop the bleeding yeah. right now. Yeah. Yep. yeah, I like that. And, and I think it's also worth highlighting the fact that we we're in like a very early phase where like you said it's very cost prohibitive right now to do some of these things so i think several years ago it was roughly six hundred dollars per ton mm -hmm. of co2 to extract from the atmosphere in the uh, carbon engineering company the one you were talking about backed by bill gates they're hoping to get that number down to like 94 to 230 $232. Right. Which in, which would be really impressive. Yeah, in 2018 they said that they had achieved $232, so mm -hmm. it'll likely get even better. Mm -hmm. And and part of why it's so cost efficient is that it's made by parts that are easily accessible throughout manufacturing. So mm -hmm. whether you're a Chinese company, an American company, a Indian company, you can put together these machines. They're not that advanced. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, you know, it's like there's this one quote I love that's sort of related to that that says, this is not a scientific problem. This is a political problem. Like it's it is also yeah. a scientific problem. But I was surprised at how far along the science is relative to how not far along the political policies and global agreements are. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's bad. Um, have you have you looked into um, some of the other companies too? Like the yeah, because like um, Switzerland, there's a company based there called uh, Climeworks, mm-hmm. and they they do something very similar, I think. But it seems like over in Europe, they're maybe a li- the political realm is a little bit it's moving faster than the U.S. Right. for sure. And maybe where you start these companies, like if anyone listening is wanting to get into this uh, space, maybe the U.S. is not the place to be right now, but maybe it's more Europe or I guess um, the uh, climate or sorry, the carbon engineering is based in Canada. So Canada Mm -hmm. seems to be a little bit more, you know, progressive in terms of climate than we are. But um, Yeah. yeah, I don't know the political the political stuff around this is really frustrating because it's slowing down progress. Right. Yeah. So I guess just to sort of lay out some of the main players in here, you know, we talked about carbon engineering. That's the company that I would put my money on out of all the players backed by Bill Gates and has really deep partnerships. They've also raised the most money. They just raised a round of $68 million. And, you know, uh, Climeworks is another good one. That's the Switzerland-based company. They are good in the sense that they've been operating for a long time, and there's already a price on carbon of $99 per ton, which is, mm-hmm. from what I saw, the highest price of, of anything I found. So it's a lot. It makes a lot more business sense for a company like Climeworks that operates in Switzerland as opposed to any other country, mm-hmm. and. Uh, another company that's actually currently the largest carbon capture company as far as like active facilities is Global mm-hmm. Thermostat. And they say, they claim that they can get to a price of $50 per ton of carbon in the near wow. future. And then the the other one I'll mention that I thought was interesting is Hypergiant Industries. Mm-hmm. And this is interesting because rather than being a commercial approach they take a personal like direct to consumer approach where anyone like you could go online and you can buy one of these hyper giant carbon capture machines stick it in the corner of your apartment and it's based on these microbes that sequester carbon and you know clean your air essentially and it has the same power as an acre of trees that you can just put in your house so it's basically like the equivalent of like living in a farm with like an acre of trees and uh that's pretty awesome because you can have super clean air and you can also just be doing your part for the planet and so it might become like a trendy thing if these things get like smaller and cooler looking and even more efficient yeah Um, i haven't heard of this company do you know how much each unit is or um it would be cool to post this to yeah that would be a good social post um, yeah, I'm not sure about the pricing, but, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's commercially viable yet, but I know they've built the prototypes and they've awesome. raised money and they've featured in fast company. Um, and then yeah, there I mean, was, I'd personally be interested in that. Yeah. If, you know, same. if it looks good. Same. I mean, it's like green. It looks like a glowing, it looks kind of like a nuclear fuel rod center. <laughs> it's the design aesthetic, but. Um, and then I've, since I've been doing all this research, I got retargeted on Instagram and I got this ad that was for these plants. That's just a normal plant, but it's a type of plant that's the best at sequestering carbon. And it actually has this special vase that it sits in that has these slits. And they explain on their landing page that the soil is actually what does the carbon sequestration process. And it's basically a natural air filter. So, and and because these are the plants that are the best at that, you can put them around your house. They look like nice plants and they actively clean your air and you don't have to replace air filters and like bulky machines or anything like that. So I'm always interested in the direct to consumer approaches. Yeah. So one of the, just to kind of go off of that a little bit, one of the things that I found interesting is people are working on uh, genetically engineering trees and plants to be more efficient at sequestering carbon and and pumping the carbon into their roots. Um, so I, I found that as maybe, the, 
I don't think it's ever going to be as effective. You know, I mean, planting trees, like we said, is going to be something that we need to do anyways. And also these plant, uh, these um, carbon sequestration uh, facilities, uh, the artificial forests. But it would also be really interesting to plant real forests with these like super plants that are very good at sequestering carbon too. And it, it seems like yeah. it mo- might be more of a, a nature focused thing. And it's, it might be only one or 2% as effective as these other things we've been talking about. But I would, I would like to walk through a forest, you know, like a forest park and just know that these trees are hyper, you know, hyper efficient compared to all of their peers compared yeah. to, you know, so anyways, that I found that a, an interesting, not alternative, but like a, a small addition to everything else totally. that we're talking about. Yeah, it's it's really, it's gotten to the point where we need all of the above solutions. Mm-hmm. It's not either or. And yeah, I mean, the great thing about trees is that they have all these side benefits, like they create these ecosystems, you have biodiversity. Mm-hmm. Um so, and they create, and there's a whole bunch of symbiotic relationships that are formed too. Like we've got the whole um, topsoil thing we talked about when, when with uh, the symbiotic relationships with fungi and they're decomposing all of these things that are dying in the soil and creating more topsoil. It's just, it's overall, um, it seems to be like it might be a holistic solution. Mm-hmm. Um, although one of the things that I um, I'm always worried about is the unintended consequences. So when we do this genetic modification, what trade-off? Like, what does that right. come at the expense of? But the you know, like maybe also... they're not. Maybe because they're so good at sequestering carbon, they're not as good at interacting with the fungi, and they, yeah, it, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. there could and, be weird side could... effects. Mm-hmm. And that would actually that seems like it might actually make sense. Like if it's very good at pulling carbon and it doesn't need to rely on other nutrients as much potentially if that's the way that they do it then then maybe there wouldn't be as many symbiotic relationships and it would compete with other more natural you know organisms that are out there um, that hadn't been genetically modified Uh, do you think there would be unintended consequences to any of these carbon sequestration like these artificial carbon capture mechanisms we're talking about, like the carbon engineering or Mm -hmm. uh, Climeworks or any of these companies and the technology that they're developing? Yeah, well, I mean, this starts to get a little into my worst case scenario, but I'll... But we could, yeah, we could save it if you want. But yeah, I'm still curious about this question. Okay. Um, Yeah, well, you want to get into the worst case scenario? All right, yeah. All right, let's do it. All right, so yeah, what do you what do you think about the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. My worst case scenario is precisely that we become too optimistic, too dependent, and too complacent on carbon capture technology. And here's why that's a bad thing. So if we only do carbon sequestration with putting up these giant machines that take in a megaton of carbon per year. We put them all around the world, but we don't mitigate our carbon emissions. Like we we figure, oh, hey, we've created this technology. We've solved our way out of this. Let's just keep, you know, emitting carbon and focusing on industry and taking oil out of the earth. That seems fairly plausible to me that 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 could happen. And it might not necessarily be bad right away, but the reason why I think it's especially risky is because if you have all of these carbon emissions each year, and then you're depending on these machines to suck all that carbon out each year, what happens if there's if the plants fail? Or what happens if they're attacked by a terrorist attack or by a rogue mm. nation? Or if they're yeah. hacked, for instance? Yeah. So it's it's a very risky scenario like imagine if you're taking a bathtub and you're just filling it up like the faucets on like full blast and then you simultaneously have a drain that's like a very powerful drain so you're draining a lot of the water out while you're rushing it in Mm -hmm. 
if mm-hmm. someone plugs the drain, it's going to very quickly spill over and it could flood your whole house. Right. And that's what could happen if we depend too heavily on this technology. Right. And so this is basically what you're basically just saying. We need a more multifaceted approach. Like yeah. we need, we need to, like you said, we need all of the above solutions. We need trees. We need to reduce actual carbon emissions. We need nuclear and clean yes. you know, solar yes. energy. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I'm with you. That's, that's pretty bad. And that seems like it would be an unintended consequence too. Right. Right. And I mean, it can get really bad if we talk about what would actually happen in that scenario. Island countries would be very much at risk. You know, we talked in the future of climate change, how all of Bangladesh is projected to be underwater in the next 50 to 100 years if we don't seriously turn around climate change. That's a whole country. And if that whole country is underground, think about underwater think about Mm -hmm. how many climate refugees that would create and then think about how it's not just bangladesh it's not just the bahamas it's not just puerto rico it's also places like new york Mm -hmm. it's also places like miami brooklyn queens all of these places are projected to be underwater and part of what's um, especially worrisome is that a lot of these places don't have a long history of dealing with natural disasters, dealing with hurricanes and flooding and that sort of thing. So they'll be a lot worse at dealing with it than, say, some of these you know, Nordic countries that have been dealing with it for hundreds of years. And my big concern is that, you know, let's say we, we get to an equilibrium where we have enough carbon sequestration that we have like, you know, neutral emissions each year, maybe a little bit on the negative side. But then, you know, some rogue nation or or terrorists or whatever, either hack or attack these facilities, just like how the Saudi oil facilities recently got attacked. You know, it's not that unprecedented. Then all of a sudden, it could create this powerful cascading effect where there's intense warming even more natural disasters, even more climate refugees, and that tends to result in more nationalism. People just sort of, you know, they hide in their turtle shells of their country. Mm -hmm. They don't care about the rest of the world. And Mm -hmm. that could be really bad. Yeah. Do you think similar to what, what you've been saying, if there is really good carbon capture technology that people are just totally disincentivized to cut carbon emissions in the first place like is is that one of the things that you know if if we do this before we cut emissions if we are good at carbon capture before we actually focus on clean energy what does that do like it that might be the situation that leads to your worst case scenario right right because then the incentives swing all the way in one direction like oh we can do we can produce all of the dirty energy we want because it's just going to get sucked out of the air and then you know that's that's just um leading to a really fragile situation Um, yeah politically you know or geopolitically like you said there could be wars that are sprung out you know just because of this and they target specifically carbon sequestration right and the the other problem that's related to the worst case is this idea of who whose responsibility is it to take on the onus of carbon capture Mm -hmm. because there's different ways you could look at it so for instance there's been some tension between china and the u.s when it's when the topic of climate change comes up because the u.s has far more total emissions than China. You know, throughout the United States' whole history, we've emitted a lot more carbon than China has in total. But every year, China far outstrips the U.S. in carbon emissions in like recent years. So the current emissions are far greater for for China. The U.S. only accounts for 15% of global emissions. So it's not like the U.S. can solve this problem on its own. And it's not like you know, countries like Switzerland and Norway are going to put much of a dent at all, a Bhutan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So really, it's about will we be able to create a global clo- coalition of cooperation, which may also require a carbon tax that spans international boundaries, 
so that if one country, like if Brazil decides to burn down the whole Amazon, they should get sanctioned by all other countries that agree to it. And we seem to be on that path when we did like the Paris Climate Accords. Now we've gone in the other direction because we've had more nationalist leaders like Trump mm -hmm. and Bolsonaro and, and uh, you know, you take your pick. There's so many leaders now that... Yeah, that a lot that. of Europe also. Yeah, Salvini and uh, and there's there's some interesting parallels where they actually tried to implement a carbon tax and then there was a huge backlash. So this happened in France and Canada. And in France, they implemented this carbon tax and then they had this yellow vest movement. Um, it was covered in the daily some some months back. And basically all these people were like, you know, screw Europe, screw those diplomats in Brussels telling us what we can and can't do like we're gonna do what's good for France and it had this big national uprising and then same mm -hmm. thing in Canada you know Trudeau implemented a carbon tax in all of the provinces in Canada mm -hmm. but then all these people you know rose up and were like hey you're taxing us this is hurting the working Canadians and and this mm -hmm. is awful and and so in both cases they came up with a good solution and that is a rebate that they would give to people who were most affected by the by the carbon tax. So essentially you collect these taxes and then rather than just, you know, putting it into the national budget or putting it towards fighting climate change, you put at least part of it back into the hands of the consumers who are paying a little bit more relative to their income on, you know, their gasoline or, or mm -hmm. the oil and gas to, to heat their house. Yeah. Um, so that seems like the right approach and we need to go in that direction, but on a global scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that. I think having some combination of the public sector and the private sector working on this, like we need, we need everyone working on it. We need, a, we need a financial incentive for people to make clean energy. We need a financial incentive for companies to sequester the carbon and to capture the carbon from the atmosphere. Um, one of the other uh, market-based solutions I've seen that worked for, I believe it was sulfur dioxide, which was a molecule that was causing acid rain in the United States. Mm -hmm. This might have been back in the, I think it was the Reagan era. I, I don't remember exactly when it was. Anyways, there's, there's this thing called a cap and trade system where every organization gets some amount of credits for this pollutant in this in that historic case it was the sulfur dioxide causing acid rain in our case what we're talking about now it could be a carbon dioxide right um credit where essentially if you're you you're allowed this many you know this much pollution essentially mm -hmm. um if you go below that like if you're a company and you're going to not hit whatever you were allowed, you can sell those to companies that are going to, you know, um, pollute a little bit more, right. which, you know, it's, that's actually the system to, Canada implemented. Okay. Yeah. So they, they have to essentially, they have to pay to pollute more or, right. and the people that are in the companies and organizations that are polluting less and, maybe sequestering carbon, that might be another factor because I don't think that was really a thing back in, in when this was originally developed. But you can make money just directly off of the, the capture itself. And mm -hmm. then you can also use the byproducts like we've talked about. We can use the, I think, uh, Climeworks is selling pure CO2 to the beverage industry, for example. Right, right. Or um, to so make reusable use... plastics I've seen. Yeah, or... yeah. Uh, yeah. Greenhouses, they're using because right. the, green, the plants in the greenhouses obviously thrive when there's a little bit higher CO2 content. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are definitely market based solutions that can be sort of a holistic or systemic approach to solving this problem. And I think, you know, we, we need to do that. Otherwise, we are going to fall into the worst case that you described. Right, of, right. Of, you know, viewing this as a silver bullet that can solve everything. Right. right. Well, another interesting thing, this is sort of um, a little bit of a detour, but I don't know if you've been following the negative interest rates in the bond market, but 
so basically with bonds, you know, you it's a way for people to keep their money safe. Mm -hmm. But there have been so many people that want to put their money somewhere safe and so few people that want to borrow money that bond rates have actually gone negative. Meaning mm -hmm. if I buy $100,000 of U.S. bonds and then 10 years later I take it out, I only have $90,000 left, which seems oh, totally God. idiotic because it's like you're supposed to put money in the bank so it gains value, not so that it loses value. And that doesn't even take inflation into account. And we're yeah. seeing negative bond rates in Europe, in parts of America. And a lot of financial folks are like worried. And this is part of why people are worried about the next recession. A good way to counter that is to heavily invest in new technologies and in new initiatives. Mm -hmm. This would be the perfect initiative with which the government can invest. If the government just yeah. pours tons of money into building these carbon sequestration plants and, you know, spurring new innovation in different areas, renewable energy, all of that, not only would it really help out and stimulate the economy and actually make bond rates go back to being positive, it would mm -hmm. also really strongly position us for the next century if the United States, you know, to, you know, uh, positions itself as the leader in renewable energy and carbon capture. And mm -hmm. so if I were president or, you know, commerce secretary or whatever, that would be like definitely my big, you know, magnum opus in the office yeah. would be to invest heavily in this technology, which helps so many different, uh, you mm -hmm. know, angles of the economy, the environment, global policy so much. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to almost be getting into some of the best case scenarios because, right. you know, economically, like you're saying, I actually hadn't been keeping up with that at all. Um, I, I, I heard about the the inverted yield curve. Right. So that's like that it was very more similar. Expensive. Yeah, it was like more expensive to borrow long term than it was in the short term, which tends not to be. Right. Uh, it's because there's so much person. idle wealth. Like so mm -hmm. many rich people that just have money sitting in bank accounts, they don't know what to do with. Yeah. They don't know mm -hmm. how to invest it well. You know, and mm -hmm. then you have like SoftBank or these, um, you know, Saudi sovereign funds and they want to invest their money in something safe because they know oil has, has no long-term future as mm -hmm. a commodity. But there's no good way to do it because no one wants to borrow money right now. Mm -hmm. And so a good way to c counteract that is just invest heavily. So the government borrows money, which then would raise, you know, bond interest rates to being positive. It could mm -hmm. make the yield curve go back to normal. We could avoid the next recession while also saving the planet. I mean, come <laughs> on, what more do you need? <laughs> oh, man, I, I hope it turns out to be as simple as that. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, I think uh, in terms, you know, if I were to round the worst case scenario out, I think you touched on a lot of it. Like I, I'm really worried about the fact that we view this as a silver bullet and re over rely on mm -hmm. carbon capture because it, we need this to be a very. We need to take a holistic approach, and carbon capture is one tool in the toolbox. Right. Um, so yeah, we. I think that's that's one component. Um, one of the other things that I was thinking about, this totally an unlikely worst case scenario, mm -hmm. but let's say we get so good at carbon capture and we get so... We capture uh, all the carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and then we get, then we, we like drive ourselves into the next ice age essentially. And then we need to worry about that. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, I know. I, I that's that's like, it's one of those worrying about overpopulation on Mars things, but it's... Um, you know, it could be a worst case scenario. I don't know what would be worse for life, whether that would be a ice age or whether that would be where we're going now. Um, but either both of those situations require or it would probably lead to mass die offs and, mm -hmm. you know, animal populations. And, you know, it. It yeah. could be bad. But yeah, I, I mean, the only the only case where I could see that we should worry about not there not being enough carbon in the atmosphere would be if there was some sort of nuclear fallout where there was now a very small group of people left on the planet and therefore 
but without any new carbon emissions and with having already sucked up a lot of the carbon, we yeah. move towards the more natural trajectory of Earth, which is going towards the next glacial period. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's v very, very unlikely, but, uh, you know, it is <laughs> it is possible in, you know, hundreds of years. Yeah, that's why I prefaced it with it's like super unlikely, yeah. but, it, you know, maybe maybe it's something that could happen. But we don't seem to have a problem with pumping co2 back into the air like we no. certainly have the technology to, be able yeah. to do that if we need to um so anyway the status quo <laughs> anti-carbon yeah, capture um so what do you think about uh, the best case then best case scenario my best case scenario is that we have godlike control over the world's temperature like the thermostat mm -hmm. and not just with carbon but with every component of the atmosphere and we essentially are agents on behalf of Gaia to just get <laughs> the optimal conditions for life at any given time and yeah. it's kind of already impressive that we've avoided the next ice age with all the dinosaur guck that we've taken out of the earth and burned into the atmosphere mm -hmm. but we've gone too far. Now the question is, will we be able to get back to mm -hmm. an optimal level for life or will we peter out and this will be the end of, of at least like the level of civilization that we've enjoyed in the last, you know, hundred years or so. Mm -hmm. And that question is still up in the air, but my best case scenario would be that we do all of the approaches that would result in an optimal control over earth's climate. So that would include an international carbon tax that truly creates a global coalition. So there's accountability for any country or person or company that emits carbon more than their fair share. It would also be really taking the example of the only country that is a net carbon sink in the world. Mm -hmm. And this country is called Bhutan. And yeah. I don't know if we can see on your map there behind you, but Bhutan oh. is essentially situated right between China and India. Mm -hmm. And it's a small country that's known for like a lot of monks living up in the in the hills and that sort of yeah. thing. But they have a phenomenal approach just with the whole way they run their country, including environmentally. So their approach is that they focus on gross national happiness, not gross domestic product yeah. and so because of that they actually care about things like the environment and trees mm -hmm. and they have free education free health care and they've also done a good job of protecting their wildlife more than 50 percent of the country is protected under wildlife conservation not only that but all of these protected areas have been interconnected with land bridges so that all of the animals can essentially roam free throughout the entire country. So they, they spotted one tiger that was in the jungle, and then a month later it was up in the up in the snowy mountains. I mean, this that's is, how it should be. That's like, how it all should of these be. These animals are nomadic and they're always on the move. Exactly, and and so they. But even Bhutan has suffered because of climate change, and not it's not their fault at all. They're actually yeah. sequestering carbon on behalf of the rest of the world because they're a net carbon sink. But even mm -hmm. still, the glaciers in Bhutan have been melting. It's been causing flooding. It's been wreaking havoc on their, their farmers' fields, on some of the ecosystems there. So even people in Bhutan are starting to freak out about the rest of the country or the rest of the world not doing enough to protect uh, mm -hmm. our, our environment. Yeah. So I think if we can all take Bhutan as an example of where we should go from here. We focus on net, on, uh, you know, net happiness rather than net product. And we not only, you know, use technology like people in Bhutan are all about going paperless and, you know, they use mm -hmm. technology. They're not, you know, they're not just like living in archaic times. Right. Um, you know, so I think there is also a place we should do carbon capture, especially right now when it's like the most critical, but simultaneously, we should protect more wildlife, create land bridges, focus on the happiness, focus on educating people so they care about it, focus on indoctrinating people 
into loving the land that they live on and loving the wildlife and mm -hmm. and you know they have a good democracy where uh, the leader has to retire by age 65 and it's so it like always sort of allows for new people to come in and I just love the way they they run things there and so th my ideal best case scenario looks a lot like Bhutan right now but without the glaciers melting because we would have already sequestered yeah. enough carbon on a global scale. Yeah. And all the, yeah, every country looking like them sounds like a pretty ideal world. And it seems like also there's a lot of research into happiness being one of the more important things for humans. There, there has been historically a th thought that, you know, economic prosperity is the only thing that matters, mm -hmm. but it seems like people in general, and there is a shift towards people coming around to the idea that happiness is more important. Like being happy on $30,000 a year, for example, is way more important than being miserable making a million dollars a year. And I think, I think when we shift this perspective and we focus on happiness, there's more research being done. And the research being done is showing we just need to be in nature. Right. Mm -hmm. And we need to protect nature. And it looks a lot like Bhutan, it, at least when I learned, I listened to that uh, TED talk. I think, was it an ambassador or was it one of the the leaders of Bhutan that did the TED talk? Yeah, I'm not sure. If, but I, yeah, he was some some leader in Bhutan. But yeah. I would encourage listeners to go um, definitely to watch that. It's It's an interesting one. But anyways, yeah, I think it would be really good to focus on happiness and the point of me saying this is happiness to me and what I think the research is pointing to is being more in tune with nature. And if we're destroying nature, then happiness will likely plummet. Like we're, if we're living in this like post-apocalyptic world without trees everywhere, without greenery, and it's just kind of like industrial and smoke, like it's not appealing to mm -hmm. a lot of people. And I think we can, we can move to that. But the one thing I want to linger on a little bit that you said that I was also thinking is the idea of a global thermostat. Mm -hmm. Because I think, honestly, this technology that we're developing is like the very early stages of that, right? I don't think we'll get to that for a while, but it seems like it's possible that we will eventually yeah. exert control over the entire earth and the climate of the earth we might even be able to prevent hurricanes but at the same time do we want to prevent hurricanes or do we want to control the direction they go or you know there there's so many complex things that happen in nature and i think that we're not going to be able to effectively control the earth until we have enough computational power to model the mm. complex systems well maybe are. now that Google has recently achieved quantum supremacy. <laughs> that'll be easier than previously thought. And that's for yeah, another I mean, episode. They, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's if we're if we're talking about um, a control system, which is essentially what this would be, j just like a thermostat in your house. Yeah, it's like a nest control. for Mother Earth. Yeah, but we could do that potentially on a way grander scale than just carbon. We could, mm -hmm. we could de, um, we could uh, de-desertify, or I think that's afforestation. So we could, we could create forests and make sure that um, deserts, it, but maybe deserts are a little bit important. So I don't want right. to. Right, like it's hard to know what this. the optimal yeah. way is to yeah. change the environment. But if we can at least stop the damage that we're doing, that's the first step. And even yeah. before that is stop subsidizing these fossil fuel companies it's right. like amazing that we're still subsidizing them mm -hmm. like i saw this one tweet that was like it was like subsidizing fossil fuels versus like putting in like a green energy bill and it was like someone trying to rake all the water back into the ocean <laughs> i mean just the scale of the efforts is like so out of whack and you know trump recently tried to get around california's imposed mandate that all fossil fuel generation must be 20 percent more carbon efficient by 2030 mm -hmm. he tried to get around it through legal means so that 
fossil fuel companies wouldn't feel compelled to innovate or improve their efficiency at all. Luckily, he didn't win. But you can just imagine if we had an administration that really cared about the environment, like an EPA leader that actually cared about protecting the environment as the <laughs> as the title stands. Um, but one thing I am very heartened by is mm -hmm. all of the global climate protests worldwide oh, that yeah. we've seen. I mean, people like, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg and all Bella Lack and mm -hmm. you know I saw them in San Francisco just all of these like Gen Zers in the streets like with signs and it was just really awesome thing to see so I do feel like well I'll save it for my most likely should we get into the most likely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. let's do it most likely scenario my most likely scenario is that the groundswell of support for the environment continues to grow. And there are simultaneously more and more nat natural disasters, more hurricanes, more flooding, more climate refugees. And these two forces play off of each other so that there's more and more and more support until the whole country is essentially on the side of the environment, protecting the environment, switching to renewables. I also think in the most likely case, nuclear becomes mainstream. So that's something we haven't talked much about in this episode. You know, we did a whole episode about the future of nuclear, but I could see nuclear as playing a very key role in creating renewable energy so that we can have a near net zero carbon emission while we're also sequestering carbon that was emitted in previous years. and. You know, I was watching the Netflix show Inside Bill Gates' Brain, and while he's working on carbon capture with carbon engineering, he's also working on improving nuclear technology, and they have found a, a pretty awesome innovation, which is that they use uh, spent nuclear fuel rods, like unenriched uranium, that is already sitting idle, that these other nuclear companies don't know what to do with because it's just piling up year after year. They can use that stuff that's just sitting there to power these nuclear generators that only need to be replaced, like the fuel cells only need to be replaced once every few decades. And not only that, but the coolant they use, rather than using water where you need to constantly put more water in, and if you don't put more water in, it'll boil, and then it'll create a you know nuclear explosion, or, or not nuclear, but it'll you know blow up the whole facility. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing that, they use liquid metal. And the liquid metal is very stable. It essentially cannot boil. Like there's no there's no reasonable temperature that would make it boil on planet yeah. Earth. Yeah. So the worst thing that could happen, like, let's say we just neglect one of these facilities that Bill Gates created because, we, you know, all everything goes to hell. Yeah. The worst thing is, is that the metal just solidifies into metal around the nuclear spent fuel rod. And it's just this harmless lump of metal afterwards. Oh, wow. So there are some pretty phenomenal innovations in nuclear. So if mm -hmm. we time that with carbon sequestration technology, and we move globally towards pre preserving the forests and nature and, and that sort of thing, we can solve this problem. And I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic having researched carbon capture than before I researched it. Because before I kind of figured, oh, it's like pie in the sky. It's probably not going to be ready for decades. It's like yeah. pretty much ready. I mean, the first yeah. carbon engineering plant is going to be uh, active in 2021 which is just yeah. a, you know, a year and change away. And I think there's already a handful of the climb works too. They were the first to the, you know, they were the first in the space. Who yeah. knows if they're going to be the leader in the space. It, like you said, it does seem like uh, carbon engineering is going to be, if not the leader, one of the, yeah. the leaders. Yeah, and it's not a competition. They're all yeah. working towards the same goal. So the yeah. more, but the more, the But it's good to better. be a competition. To, right. Like, financially, it's good that there's competition. Oh, right? yeah, the, yeah. Like, they're, if they are competing against each other, and, and that's, this kind of plays off of what you were saying with the dynamics of, like, there's a very negative thing happening right now, but at the same time, there is a response to that. Mm -hmm. And that response is 
really overwhelmingly positive in my mind. The, I mean, yeah. the, the actual events are overwhelmingly negative and I think that, you know, the, the positive can win out. Like we're pretty freaking smart creatures as humans. Like we can, we can figure this out, but, um, have you, we, um, Oh, sorry. This is like a really out there thing, but have you heard of this, of the cerulean hypothesis? I haven't. Tell me. So I, I was thinking about it because you said humans are so smart and we'll figure this out. Uh-huh. There's the cerulean hypothesis, which is that, you know, there are five major mass extinctions before humanity. One was the dinosaurs with asteroids, but the other four all came about as a result of more carbon in the atmosphere than was optimal for life. Wow. Now, we think, we assume that that carbon happened naturally. Like it wasn't like people digging up stuff and burning it. It was, you know, natural processes on Earth. Mm -hmm. But the Cerulean hypothesis is, would we even be able to tell if there were intelligent life back then that did exactly what we're doing now and made themselves go extinct because of the way that the tectonic plates move and they sort of just recycle everything. If it's that long ago, if it's like, you know, however many hundreds million years ago, that would, we, there would be no record of it anymore. You couldn't dig anything up because the earth would have already churned out new tectonic plates over it. Yeah. So it's an interesting hypothesis to think is it possible that some other species did achieve supreme intelligence over the other species, but then did themselves in by emitting too much carbon? And would we have any way of proving that that didn't happen? And the reason it's an interesting thought experience is, mm. is because you can't really prove that it didn't happen. We just assume, yeah. oh, yeah, it must have been natural warming, you know? Right. Um, yeah, that's actually, that's really interesting. I think... Um, Graham Hancock, who is a, I don't know if he's a professional, I don't know if he has a PhD and like did actual, like, you know, a, di a dissertation on the subject, but he writes a lot about how there was likely once a very advanced civilization. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that was like before, after the most recent mass extinction. So like within our most recent era there hmm. could have been a very extremely um, advanced civilization. I think it was yeah. more like towards the Egyptian. He, he focuses a lot on the Egyptians and stuff. Anyways, I don't know if that has anything to do with what you're yeah. saying. But, but well, this I'm would be very, far very before curious. that. And, and they actually, there's no reason to think that it would be ape-like. You know, it could very well be fish-like, yeah. like a really smart fish living in the ocean that has, or, or like, uh, you know, some sort of amphibian reptile you know, type of creature. Um, yeah. But it's it just fascinating like to think. Like the, it seems like the only creatures that would have that capability are ones that can use tools. Like we, our whole existence is based on the tools that we create. It seems like it would need to be pretty much any creature that can manipulate its environment with some sort of dexterity. Like it has, yeah. whether those are tentacles or whether those are fingers, like it probably doesn't matter. Right, right. But yeah, I mean, I, I find it um, inspiring in a way because when you think about the fact that if there were another species that were able to create this global thermostat that we're talking about and maintain an equilibrium with their civilization, we would probably have seen it by now, you know, in mm -hmm. space on another planet. And it's possible that we had already achieved that at some point in the past. But as far as we know right now, we're the only ones that we know for sure have reached this level of civilization and, mm -hmm. you know, control or symbiosis with the way our planet works. That's a little bit scary because it shows that there's no one else has really done it yet, at least yeah. as far as we know. So it's all the more reason to not get complacent and just think, oh, we'll figure it out eventually. We figured everything else out so far. And mm -hmm. we really need to make sure that, that we maintain, that we keep the light alive, as Elon Musk says. Yeah, the light the of consciousness. Void, 
yeah and avoid this great filter that might you know be right in front of us right like this this right. literally could be it the the great filter that everyone you know that talks about when they talk about the fermi paradox right right so yeah man yeah that's that's a scary one i i think i think we can rise up to it i think that we can that we can do it but kind of like a lot of our our likely scenarios we need to go through bad to get the motivation to get there mm -hmm. right like we we have the capability as humans we need the incentives right because we right. are still biological and we are still flawed creatures we still care about more short-term things than long-term things you know but if we can think long term, if we can respond to these, you know, these catastrophes that that you were describing earlier, mm -hmm. then, you know, we we can probably I think we can fig I can I think we can figure it out. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm much more optimistic now than before I researched this. Mm -hmm. And I guess to round out the most likely as far as what is actually likely to happen, because we're not saying the cerulean hypothesis with smart fish <laughs> beings is like really going to happen or has happened, but global carbon emissions will continue to rise. Mm -hmm. Developed nations will likely optimize their level of carbon that they add to the atmosphere. So we'll, we'll emit less carbon each year, but net we're still going to be adding more carbon total to the atmosphere for the, the foreseeable future. Um, the world will still be emitting carbon by 2050. I think that's pretty, yeah. it'd be pretty hard to say otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I believe we will have carbon sequestration by 2050, like at a wide scale. I'm yeah. hoping, and I also predict that by 2030, we'll drop below $100 per cost to sequester one ton of carbon. Mm -hmm. And... I believe we will also have a carbon tax, if not globally, at least across, you know, the top 100 countries by, let's say, the year, you know, 2050. And right. then finally, I'll say natural, natural disasters will continue to increase. More support will the for the environment will also continue to in increase. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as global perceptions change, we will make this a real fight and you know there's going to be a lot of refugees and people that are going to be hurting but i also am optimistic that we will take this challenge head on and save the planet yeah yeah i'm totally with you i think those are pretty much right in line with mine i do think you know to say a couple other things the information that's out there it it lets people know that things are actually happening. I feel like historically people just haven't been able to see any change that's taken place and therefore they can deny what's going on. Mm -hmm. It seems like that is not going to be the case and is not the case anymore. Right. Like Mitch McConnell finally admitted that humans play a role in climate change like last year. And yeah. It's like, okay, finally. <laughs> like, God, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Yeah. So it, I think I think people are coming around to it and I think I think the younger generation is seeing it and they're they're a little less, you know, ingrained in the the den the denial phase of mm -hmm. this whole thing. So, yeah, I'm I'm I think that all you said was was correct and I think that we are, you know, in the likely case going to figure this out. I do have one question in you know in in this likely case when you say natural disasters are likely to happen and um stuff like that continuing going forward do you think things will get so bad at some point where there is a come to jesus moment where we basically get together as earthlings as you know humans and create a global government like is that yeah. something government i, I do we well do? okay I, it's it, hard to I know think, if it'll be like a global government or if it will just be a global agreement you know yeah, like yeah, i don't yeah. think we're gonna have like we're all raising the earth flag and countries don't exist in the next you know 30 or 50 years 
But I do think that as some of these horrible effects continue to happen, like, you know, Bangladesh going underwater and more of more, you know, forests burning and just all the horrible things that are projected, it's going to be really hard to ignore. And if you're if the people in your country care about it, you as a leader better do something or else you're going to be out of office, even if you're a dictator. Mm -hmm. So that's where I have the most hope is that the people themselves are going to wake up, even if they're being lied to by the state media, when they see these horrible disasters and, you know, they're able to access the dark web or whatever through VPNs. And, you know, even if information is controlled, I think that the public momentum will force countries to actually do what's best for the planet yeah i I think i think that's probably a good take on it i I don't really know if we will you know have a full government but there like you said there's got to be some sort of agreement that the whole world comes together and and we we try to solve this anyways any last words for the the listeners or Oh, I think that's I think that's a good place to end it. I mean, I would say I would say uh, watch the speech that Greta Thunberg just gave. It's a very compelling speech, mm-hmm. and do whatever you can personally to help the environment. And a lot of that might just be talking to people about it. And you know, if there are climate strikes near you, joining them and. Um, you know, whatever you can do to vote for the right people in office and vote for the right bills as they as they come to pass. And yeah, other than that, you know, thank you everyone for listening. This has been the future of carbon capture. And what will and we'll see you next time. The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present. Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.